Welcome back to the physical chemistry of the life sciences section of thermodynamics. We have a new week. We start with a new chapter. This week's chapter is number five. And specifically this knowledge clip here will introduce you to the concept of the chemical potential, mu i. Moreover, we are going to talk about equilibrium and non-equilibrium conditions for that chemical potential, mu i. But before we get started, let's do a brief recap of what we did last week. The Gibbs free energy, G, was introduced. The definition of the Gibbs free energy is the enthalpy H minus the temperature times the entropy. Enthalpy H has a definition itself, which is the internal energy plus PV. And plugging this in gives us another equation for the Gibbs free energy. The change of the Gibbs free energy at constant temperature and constant pressure is calculated with this formula, delta H minus T delta S. We found that for a spontaneous process, delta G must always be smaller than zero. So the sign of delta G tells you whether this process is spontaneous or not. Moreover, that um, sign of delta G, whether it's positive or negative, it depends on the sign and the value of the delta H and delta S term. So for instance, if you have a large positive delta H term, then an increase of the entropy, a positive uh, change of the entropy may not be sufficient to um, actually make delta G negative so that even with a positive entropy change, you may still have a positive delta G. Other way around could be if you have a negative enthalpy change, um, but you have a, a large negative delta S, then this term will become positive. And if it outweighs the negative delta H, then delta G again could become positive and therefore the process not spontaneous. So that's what I mean with it depends on the sign and value of delta H and delta S. Delta G has a second important meaning, which is it tells you the maximum amount of non-volume work that a system can perform. We will talk a little more about this today. Furthermore, we introduced last week chemical thermodynamics. For chemical reactions, you can define also a Gibbs free energy change. So, which is simply the Gibbs free energy of the products minus the Gibbs free energy of the reactants. And we can calculate the Gibbs free energies of the products and reactants with these terms, which are the summations of the stoichiometric coefficients times the corresponding Gibbs free energy values for each reactant and product in the reaction. Then we have introduced standard states, where, which is indicated by this degree symbol at the um, Gibbs free energy change. And those standard states, typically 298 Kelvin and one atmosphere, um, allow us also to def define the so-called Gibbs free energy of formation, which are tabulated numbers for any molecule. And you can use these values to calculate the Gibbs free energy change of any reaction with this formula. You simply plug in the Gibbs free energy of formation for each product or reactant in the formula and uh, replace the free energy value here for the random for the for the for the um, definition of the Gibbs free energy that has general meaning. Okay, let's then go into the new content of the class today. Okay, so this week I'm introducing to you the so-called chemical potential mu i. Let's do this on an example. I'm drawing here a cell, the cell membrane that encapsulates the interior of the cell at a certain temperature or pressure. It could also be a potato. It looks quite similar. Now, when we want to calculate a change of the Gibbs free energy, we can use these so-called partial derivatives. So dg, an infinitesimal small change of the free energy, can result, for instance, when the temperature changes, right? Then we say, we ask, how does g change with respect to the temperature at constant pressure, which this partial derivative tells us? 
and we multiply it with the temperature change. Furthermore, the Gibbs free energy can also change with the pressure. So we have to add another term that considers for that. In this example, it's then the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to the pressure at constant temperature. And that partial derivative multiplied with the pressure change will give us the value of how the Gibbs free energy changes when the pressure is changed. Now, um, so far, we've only talked about changes of the pressure and the temperature um, as examples. Now I would like to also let you know that there can be a change of um, molecules um, in the cell, which I depict in green now. Those molecules may be able by some means to travel in or out of the cell, for instance, through membrane proteins. So we can account for this amount of um, molecules that can go in and out um, with the change of the molecules or the moles of um, component one, which is in green, dn1. And the question now is how does the Gibbs free energy change when we um, add or take out molecules from the cell via dn1? Again, we use the, the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy, which I write here. It tells us how the Gibbs free energy changes by addition or subtraction of molecules in or out of the cell. And we multiply that partial derivative with the amount of added or subtracted cells, uh, molecules from or to the cell. But now that um, partial derivative must be taken at constant pressure and temperature since we are only changing the amount of molecules in the cell. Right? But that also means that for the partial derivatives with respect to temperature and pressure, we also have to be aware that they are taken at constant amount of molecules in the cell. Right? There can also be other kinds of molecules in the cell. The green ones are species one and the red ones are species two. Right? So we can account for the change of species two in the same way that we write again, how does the free energy change when we change the amount of molecules type two across the cell membrane. And that is now at constant pressure, constant temperature, but also at constant N1, for instance, so not uh, two, right? So we have to also keep this amount of uh, molecules now constant when we take the partial derivative. Okay, so, and the same goes for amount of uh, species one, it should not be species two that changes, but species one. And species two will stay constant for this partial derivative. So we can add more components, such as species three, four, and so on, um, and express the Gibbs free energy change then with, for each species, one of these um, partial derivative terms. Okay, so, but we've now seen from before that a change of the free energy with respect to the temperature is nothing else than the negative entropy. And that entropy is basically telling us how does the free energy change with the temperature. Moreover, we've seen that how the, when the um, free energy changes with the pressure, we can express that with the volume. The volume tells us how does the free energy change with the pressure. And the same we do now for these two terms here, which we then call the chemical potential mu1 for species 1 and mu2 for species 2. So you see those chemical potentials, what they stand for is how does the free energy change with the amount of species or component 1, 2, 3 and so on. Good. So we now have a kind of universal equation for the free energy change. I would like to just introduce some nomenclature here. When I write mu like this, then I mean the change of the free energy with the amount of moles. So that means one mole is the Avogadro constant, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules. And for that 
free uh, chemical potential. The unit is joules per mole. When I put a bar above the chemical potential, then I mean how does the chemical potential change with each added or subtracted molecule, not mole. And the unit then of the chemical potential will just be joules because molecules alone don't have uh, units. Um, so the capital N here stands for actually really the number of molecules while the lowercase n stands for the an amount of moles, which are a lot of molecules, right? So basically this definition of the chemical potential tells you how the Gibbs free energy changes when one single molecule is added or taken out from the system. Yeah. But now a warning. And unfortunately, in, um, in, in the class materials, the nomenclature is opposite from the molecules of life, the textbook, where um, the bar above the mu is actually used for the chemical potential per mole. So please be aware of this, that in the book, the nomenclature is the opposite as from the lecture notes and the knowledge clips. So we've learned that at equilibrium, the free energy reaches a minimum. Remember this U, where at the bottom, the um, free energy has a minimum. And we stated that here, equilibrium is reached because um, the Gibbs free energy doesn't change anymore at that position. So we can use the chemical potential to actually um, characterize equilibrium between different phases, states of aggregation, such as liquid and vapor, or also different compartments in, 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 a, uh, in a cell, for instance, at constant pressure and temperature. So here's an example um, with two different compartments. So you have this um, kind of cage in the middle where there is a higher concentration of uh, molecules compared to the surrounding. And therefore, the chemical potential inside here will be different than the chemical potential outside. Right? Alternatively, you could have the dividing wall um, here between two compartments, one and two, in the middle like this. And now you have different um, components, different species, green, black, and red. Some of them may be able to travel through this wall. It could be a semi-permeable wall, like a cell membrane that only lets certain molecules go through while others cannot. And then a certain equilibrium will be reached between the two compartments. So I call the reservoirs one or two or here in and out. And I call the components or species, I, I call them species I, like species one or two or three. And in, on the example on the right, now when I write the chemical potential, I write chemical potential of species I here in the index and for compartment one, which is this one here in the exponents. Um, and the same for species I in compartment two. And here I would write on the inside chemical potential of species I on the inside and chemical potential I of, spe uh, of species I on the outside. Right? So just how I express the chemical potential. Okay, so let's look at the first example where we have this um, system composed of an inner and an outer region. And it is possible um, for the blue molecules here to cross this dashed wall here because of the holes, they can go out and others from the outside can go in. It is just like a cell with a semi-permeable membrane where certain molecules can cross the membrane, others cannot. And now we tell, we say that the chemical potential inside is for the blue A molecules is mu A in and outside is mu A out. And you know from intuition that over time, um, the concentrations on the inside and on the outside, they will balance each other out. They will, they will be the same eventually, right? So spontaneous change that will happen will be that inside and outside, you'll have the same concentration of these blue molecules. So that means this year will be the equilibrium state. And now 
at equilibrium, what we know from before is that the free energy does not change anymore. dg, constant pressure and temperature, is zero, right? That's the equilibrium statement. So we can express dg with minus s dt plus v dp plus this term that contains the chemical potentials times the amount of molecules that uh, exchange between the inside and the outside here at constant pressure and temperature. So, but we know at constant pressure and temperature, the dt and v dp terms are going to be zero and all that is left will be the chemical potential term. Okay, so let's take a look. Reservoir in and reservoir out, and we only have one component A, right? So then we can write this formula out for the change of the free energy. So we simply say the chemical, um, the, the free energy change equals the chemical potential of the A molecules on the inside times the amount of molecules that cross this dashed wall plus the chemical potential of the molecules uh, on the outside times the amount of molecules that go from the, that go in or out from the outside okay now we know that both and that must be zero at equilibrium we know that na in and na out they both refer to the same molecule A, right? So if molecules now from the um, enter the inside region, then there would be DNA in would be positive, right? We would add molecules. That would mean where do they come from? They can only come from the outside region, right? So any molecules that goes from the that goes to the inside comes from the outside. That means if a molecule enters to the inside, it leaves the outside. And that can be written with this expression. Simply that if a molecule enters the inside, then the same molecule leaves the outside. So DNA in is negative DNA out, right? Simply as that. With this, we can in this expression for the free energy, replace the DNA out with DNA in, which I do here. Now the free energy change is expressed only with the DNA in um, moles that cross the system's boundary, multiplied with the respective chemical potentials of the in and outside regions. And now we can factor out DNA in and write it like this chemical potential A in minus chemical potential A out times DNA in equals zero at equilibrium. You know that even at equilibrium, the molecules will move around. They will still be able to go from the inside to the outside and from the outside to the inside. So even at equilibrium, DNA in will never be zero. That simply means that the expression in the parenthesis must be zero. So mu A in minus mu A out must be zero. And that leads us to the very important realization that at equilibrium, mu A in equals mu A out, right? That's the important conclusion from this slide. At equilibrium, the chemical potentials are the same. Okay, in this slide, I want to tell you a second important um, piece of information about the chemical potential. Now, at not at equilibrium, um, when the system is not yet at equilibrium, like here, for instance, then um, we know that the free energy G will decrease, right? So that means DG will be negative for a change towards equilibrium. Okay, let's reuse that equation we came up with on the previous slide. How does the free energy change um, based on the chemical potential difference between the inside and the outside times the amount of molecules that cross this dashed line here, right? And we know that must be negative because we are approaching equilibrium over time. Okay, so now look at the non-equilibrium situation here. The inner region 
has a higher amount of blue molecules A than the outer region. That means over time, um, effectively, the blue molecules will leave the inner region um, and enter the outer region, right? So for DNA in, that means the amount of Na will decrease. That means DNA in must be negative, right? If DNA in is negative and DG must also be negative, then that parenthesis here, this, this expression of the chemical potentials, must be positive, right? Because a positive number times a negative number gives you a negative number. If the difference would be negative, then you would multiply a negative number with a negative number, which gives you a positive number, which is not the case. So if DNA in decreases, then mu A in minus mu A out must be larger than zero, as simple as that, right? If that is true, then mu A in must be larger than mu A out, which is set here, right? Otherwise, it would not be positive, right? This number on the left must be larger than that number to keep that positive. Okay, so that actually teaches us something important, namely that molecules move from regions of high chemical potential to regions of low chemical potential, right? Here in that region at this non-equilibrium state, the chemical potential is higher than on the outside. And that drives the, the, the transport of, of blue molecules from the inside to the outside. Yeah. This second important conclusion is here again written. The inner region has a higher um, chemical potential in the outer region and that shows us that the molecules from the inner region move towards the outer region where there is a lower chemical potential. Okay. Okay, looking one more time at the equation for the free energy change, minus SDT plus VDP plus the chem sum of chemical potentials times the amount of molecules that crosses the system's boundary. At constant pressure and temperature, we only have the amount of molecules times their chemical potentials, indicating the, the magnitude and sign of the free energy change. Now, what we learned in last week's classes was that the free energy change at constant pressure and temperature is a measure for the maximum non-volume work the system can perform. Interesting now, because you see now that actually the transport of molecules times their chemical potential gives you the amount of non-volume work that the system is capable to, to perform. And that's exactly what's happening here. I remember the example of the synthesis of ATP. There is the inside of the cell where there's a high concentration of protons. Those protons, they want to go out of the cell because on the outside, there is a lower chemical potential and therefore the high chemical potential protons on the inside move to the low chemical potential region on the outside. And that is used by the ingenious um, machinery of the cell to rotate this membrane protein. And that rotation is translated via kind of a shaft to this upper membrane protein part in which ADP and inorganic phosphates are combined due to these conformational changes of the membrane protein which are triggered by the rotation which comes from the movement of the protons from the inside of the cell where there is a high chemical potential to the outside of the cell where's there where there's a low chemical potential so here you see the importance of the chemical potential for describing biochemical uh, reactions. That brings me to the summary of this knowledge clip, which was, which was part one of the chemical potential. We've learned that for an open system, the free energy can also change by addition or removal of molecules from the system. 
the extent of the change of the free energy per mole of added or removed molecules is given by the chemical potential mu i, which basically is the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the amount of added or removed molecules of species i at constant temperature pressure and only for species i, not species j. Moreover, at equilibrium, the values of the chemical potential mu i in different regions at equilibrium they are equal, right? So that um, there is no more um, exchange basically of molecules because the free energies are then the chemical potentials are the same. And we've also learned that molecules move from regions of high chemical potential to regions of low chemical potential. That's it for this knowledge clip. In the next knowledge clip, that will be part two of the chemical potential, we will learn how to derive an expression that characterizes the chemical potential independence of the concentration. See you!